So here we are at the Central Arkansas Library Systems Roberts Library with Suzanne Farr to retake her talk from Legacies and Lunch in September of 2022. So take it away, Suzanne. Always great to have an opportunity for a reboot. So <laughs> thanks for that. Sorry that the recording didn't turn out as well as we had hoped the first time around, which was a great chance to be here at the library and to have members of the Women's Project in the audience so that we were able to have their questions and have their comments and get them to tell a bit of their history because that was in the, in the style of the Women's Project of including everybody. But at this point, I'll be, I'll be talking and telling the story of the Women's Project, which I think is a really, really important story, particularly for this time and in a time in which we so badly need organizing, so badly need to uh, build community, so badly need to eliminate division. And so we're talk talking today about a small organization in Arkansas, but a really impor important organization. That we're going to be talking about the years of the Women's Project between 1980 and 1999. And in that, um, I want to give I give history and also sort of the meaning of what we did and the methods of, of what we did. Because I think there's a story to be told that's helpful today in how we organize. There are many ways that we do it, and so this is one of the one of the ways. And so I want to want to bring bring that to it to people's attention. So I want to start with the climate that we we had the political climate for the creation of this. That, you know, organizations, if they're good, they don't just pop out of nowhere. Someone's not sitting around saying, oh, this would be a good way to get a job. <laughs> no, indeed, this is, when I, when I think of movement organizations, they have to come from a, a climate that's there that offers possibility or offers such danger that you create something. And in this case, um, it was a, it was the climate of possibility. And I, I remember for years always hearing Miles Horton say at, at the Highland Center that movements happen, happen when there are rising expectations. And this, the Women's Project came at a time in which there were rising expectations. Of course, the danger came afterwards <laughs> that we knew there was danger at the time. But the expect expectation that we could meet that danger, that we could organize against it, and create something that was a different path that people could take, and that was important. What were those rising expectations? It came out of the civil rights movement having, having occurred in the 60s and the 70s, well, far earlier than that, but the, but the victories of the civil rights movement. And then what, what we could call the babies, the children of the civil rights movement. So out of that came, you know, the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, work, farm workers, the um, AIM, American Indian movement, all of those rising out of that opening that the civil rights movement made for us. And having that happen in so many places, you know, so many levels at the same time, and having some interconnection, feeling like What's being said in one is similar to what's being said in the other. Gave us that sense that something could be done. And of course the women's movement at that time was in a wonderful, wonderful uh, place of rising up. And so one of the things that we learned from that, and you'll hear this coming out later on, is one of the best ways to organize is in small groups. And so, just remember that from, from the women's movement. <clears throat> All the small groups of people meeting together, telling the stories of their lives. Also, it was a tremendous time of um, cultural change within, within every aspect of what we call, call culture in terms of music and art and poetry. Just such production and such inspiration and creativity. So messaging was happening on all those levels, through novels, through writing, through, you know. I, I loved in particular, <coughs> excuse me, and in particular the music that messaged 
messes all, all the time. And it was also the time in which there was the rise of black women's leadership. So the, you had the rise of the women's movement, predominantly white, but at the same time there was this rise of lead, leadership. <clears throat> and we were extraordinarily affected by that. And that, that was the time, I think, around 1976, that the Kambahi River Collective Statement was, was presented to the world. <laughs> at the time, it seemed it was pre presented to the few, and now it is very much presented to the world. And that statement was the first time <clears throat> that we came, those of us who were left-leaning or leaning more towards socialism or leaning, leaning more toward civil rights and human rights, that was the first time that we had heard a clear statement of intersectionality. The idea that in our bodies and in our lives, <clears throat> we're not one identity. We are multiple identities. And some of those identities that have brought discrimination against us, some of those are identities that have liberated us. But it was incredib incredibly important to not only recognize the multiple identities that people carry, but also the multiple issues that they face, that those were connected and similar. And this is sort of a perfect idea for how do you organize. You don't organize on just one issue and ignore all of the other issues that are connected to that. You don't organize on just one identity and all the issues that are connected to that. So that was a huge, huge impact. And then it was the, the cultural part was that was rising, I think, Sweet Honey of the Rock. You know, this, this beautiful uh, group, group of black women, many so we're born out of the out of the civil rights movement, but carrying the message all the time of freedom and justice and the most glorious music that you could ask ask for. Um, there was a, another thing that was rising in terms of culture was the publication of books by black authors and by women of color, and you think of that as, uh, in particular through the kitchen table press, which um, produced those books and. Suddenly, here you had these books that you could that you could read that were not fiction, but they gave you those those uh, very things that the Gamahi River Collective Statement had, had provided, which is the multiplicity of our lives, the multiplicity of our needs, the multiplicity of our oppression. You know, so that was a great framework for creating a women's organization. This particular one came out of both experience with domestic violence and with um, doing anti-war work and doing civil rights work. And it, I think the, the strength of what the women's um, anti-violence movement of working on rape and um, incest and uh, physical violence against women moved all of us. Once that became public to us, and I think it's important for us to remember here that prior to about 1969, you didn't hear someone say, I have been raped. I always say the most courageous woman in the world is that first woman who stood up in a public place and said, I was raped. <clears throat> it changed everything. It changed everything for us. I remember vividly the first time I sat in a group and heard the word battered women and heard women tell their stories. And that went public, public as in, in the movement. It was a life change. It was like, this is something that has to stop. This is something that cuts across race, class. It cuts, cuts across everything that in our lives, and virtually everybody is affected by this. And so that led, I think, to having more and more conversations about feminism and about violence against women and the beginning of conversations in terms of, in terms of race. And then there was the election, <clears throat> the campaign, and the election of Ronald Reagan. Uh, at that time, I was working with VISTA, which is a, in this state, had tremendous leadership from Freeman McKendra. And Freeman uh, offered me a job at VISTA. This was after I had been fired from my, not fired, I 
take that back. I left my job <laughs> as the head of Head Start in Northwest Arkansas after being attacked for being a lesbian and threatened, had, having had public hearings held without my being able to attend. I remember vividly standing outside a door while I was being talked about inside as this potential threat to the children that I was working with. And managed to stay because I said, if you, if you fire me, I will put this in every newspaper in this state. I will make it as public as it can possibly be. <clears throat> and so I was looking for a job. And I thought Vista might be good. So here I go from being back to the land person, <laughs> an activist in, in the streets of New Orleans, to being director of, of a, a Head Start. And not, a, not a, the, the whole, the several counties of Head Start, to not having a job. And I meet Freeman McKedra. And he puts me to work interviewing old people in Northwest Arkansas. It was, a, it was a job to interview them to see what their needs were, which put me right in the middle of working with older women and men, but particularly older women, put me right in the issue of economic injustice, put me right in the issue of the faulty health care system, but, you know, name it, they put me in the middle of all of that. So I'm also at the same time trying to create women's organizations and because there are all these calls coming through because of the anti-violence movement, you know, we need to do something, we were trying to do something in this town, here in the Delta, or here in the, this small town in the mountains. And Freeman said, you know, you're good at this, you know, just keep on doing this with older, older people. And I said, you know, I really want to see if we could figure out a way to work with these, these younger groups. He said, well, let's get the money. And he takes me to Tom Gray at the, the, the um, Rockefeller Center. And Tom says, and this is, I think is important for this story, which is, go ahead and do a nonprofit. It's incredibly important because Reagan has, it was right as Reagan was being elected. He said, Reagan is elected and it's going to be dangerous for you to be a nonprofit with the work that you're wanting to do in terms of the kind of change that you're wanting to make. And so, go to church to be your fiscal sponsor. And we did. We got the... United Methodist Church, one of the uh, superintendents of the church out in Fort, of the conference out in Fort Smith, had worked with us on the uh, and were battered women, and he said, "Sure, we'll do it." So for five years, this little radical organization was under the umbrella of the United Methodist Church. So that is that is the background. But I think the important thing to know to to actually land the women's project is that rising expectation and the election of Ronald Reagan. And I just want to say a few things rapidly about that, which is we were able to see right away that the methodology is going to be to mobilize resentment. It's like Gene Hardesty's beautiful book, Mobilizing Resentment, which talks about the rise of the right. And that that methodology is the same today. <laughs> it's the same tactics. is to foster resentment, divide people off, and then basically move until you you sort of win win the the conversation with people. You know that you're constantly giving this information, information that's disinformation, or this or miss information, and then move people to the vote. And when you move move take that resentment and move it to the vote, you start putting in place the policies of authoritarianism. And that's the gradual move. At first, you don't see what that is. You think, oh, this is just conservative. This is just a bunch of people who are um, new evangelicals that have been brought into the fold. This is, you know, religious based. Then you think, no, this is also economic based. Oh, this is also politically based. What is this? And you watch, you start watching it move, and then begin to realize slowly, so slowly that many people are just realizing it today. But this gradual moving you toward opposition of women's women's uh, bodily autonomy, the opposition of the ERA at at that time, 
the opposition of, of um, homosexuality, the, the extraordinary effort to define a family permanently and forever, man, woman, and child, and no other way. Heterosexual man, heterosexual woman, and heterosexual child, uh, and to, to to make that com that that defining very very fierce. Um, and we knew it from the, I mean that was all part of the camp campaign as it came up against Jimmy Carter in the election of, of Reagan, and then Reagan, Reagan hit the ground running with you know the first attack immediately against workers, and then the. Um, that was against, against unions, and the se second to take down the social contract. And you could just see that bit by bit by bit. And so much to talk about that, I shouldn't say, but the two things within it, I think, in terms of methods is, is important. One is the racializing of social issues. So crime becomes black, eventually turns to black and brown, but in the 90s. It was a heavy focus on, I think, I would say, inducing crime. And then by inducing, I still believe that, for example, in Little Rock, I don't think that the drugs that came in at that time were brought in by accident. And that is, that's a conspiracy theory, I know, but uh, extraordinary change happened in Little Rock over the 80s, and by 1992, we had the most murders that we have ever, that we have. Well, now we've just, we've just upped them. But, so that's what we, that's what we were looking at, and the racializing, that crime is black, the problems with schools is because of immigration. The, you know, I can just name on and on and on here, that each piece, welfare, it's all about black people. And it was just, they, Everything that you could think of as a social issue, that particularly that touched on the, the social contract, you know, of what we want to provide for people, was identified as being an issue of people who don't deserve getting something from those of us who do, and that's um, this this is this is what we had to fight at every at every turn. Um, the idea that some people are deserving and some are not. Some have earned it, and others haven't, and they're taking away something from us. There's always this sense that there's not enough to go around, you know, that the pot is only this big and these people are picking off it all the time. Those immigrants, those black people, those, those, those are picking off this, out of this pot, so you're going to lose something. So that's the background. Um, and what we saw was that, that was needed to combat this was a sense of building a movement and building a community. And we thought the two went together, that you couldn't build one without building the other. And this required what many of us still talk about now, is the need for working in community on the ground, that the issue is not working at this height, making this big name, or creating this humongous organization, or, or having the most style. It's a matter of being in your neighborhood, in your community, and developing power in that community to make change and to manage to manage your community. So we had that, that vision of bringing people together under the idea of equality and justice. How would we do that? And we wanted to work with women, and we wanted to work across race, and we wanted to work across gender, and we wanted to work across the span of the economics, but particularly for those who um, had suffered the most in the economic system in this country. So, and how we were to do that? At first we started out through, through Kima, Prima McKendra, who gave us a little, little possibility of having a year of four or five um, workers that, that we sent out across the state. We met collectively and went to different, different communities to help people build their organizations. And then Reagan knocked that out, you know. Suddenly you had no money for that. And that's, that's when we started putting it um, entirely under the Methodist Church. And so, we, so what, we, what we wanted to do is create 
an organization that mirrored the justice that we wanted. And we thought that was a pretty big idea. <laughs> so we, we, we called that political integrity, that we could, we could create something that people would believe in because they would see it was authentic, because they would believe, see that it would include them. And so, how did we do that? We, we, we wanted to work on, on three particular things. One was economic injustice. Other was gender oppression, and other was racial oppression. So racism, sexism, and uh, economic injustice. So how do you how do you do that in an organization? Well, in 1980, there was quite extraordinary amount of, of racial separation and and injustice, and the the way you most people moved if you were going to break that was you hire yourself one person of color. <laughs> and you put yourself, put one person of color on the board, and you take that and you say, "See, <laughs> we do care. We do. <laughs> you know, it's all of, a, all of the whiteness. You know that. You know. So you exceptionalize everyone, and also put too much pressure, and and not give enough privilege or power or uh, possibility. And so we said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to have an organization, and we want." With the board and the staff, we want the majority to be black. And we were thinking, with 1980, we're thinking black, black and white, you know, as opposed to multi multiracial in the way we do now. And so that was that was that was critical. But then what we faced was, you know, this hierarchy of of, of, of oppression. So we didn't want to uh, hire hire people and then say. But you take this job where you don't have very much voice and very much money, and you get this job where you get lots of voice and lots of money. And we're not going to make it specific, specifically a collective, but we're going to make we're going to work to equalize power in this. So we're going to make jo our decisions jointly. So that we thought, well, we're in the United States, and we're a place that is ruled by capitalism. So how do you do this? Clearly, what we need to do is pay everybody the same money, and not make it, make decisions about their pay according to what kind of work they're doing, but how how what they bring to their work. So, at the women's project, you could be someone who provided childcare, or you could be someone who wrote the grants, or or made the speech. Then you all made the same money, and it made a tremendous difference. It it moved us moved us into a sense of we are sharing this. We also felt that it's not just that you make the same money. You need to have a you need to have a bite of the pie, you know, you need to be in the decision making. And so that was that was the other thing that that we did was, you know, that we build the agenda together. That we say that we're in Arkansas to almost hundred percent emphasis for white people in terms of services and in terms of opportunities. So we're going to, we're going to work in the Delta. We're going to work in the places where, where that attention is not brought, where the organizing training and skills and whatever we have to offer is not brought. We're going to see if we can provide opportunities for people to come and be part of something that is rich and, and good. And so that's how we moved. Um, and so we never had more than about five staff people, and then we had a couple of interns sometimes when there would be a little, little bit of a progressive college that would want to, want to, <laughs> to do that. Um, but that collectivity, we thought, was critical. That it, what is the world we want to build? We want to build a world in which people are collected, connected to one another, where people are interdependent. And where people can um, not all be the same, not by any means, but where different ideas can rise up without a fight happening, where where people can have different personalities and dis different dreams without that having to be comp competitive at a fight, that not to bring competi competitiveness of the marketplace, because the U.S. is a marketplace, <laughs> into into the organization, so. 
So if everybody had to make the same shares decision making and build the agenda together, then we thought that would that would put us on our way, and it did. Um, and then we just, as I said, we decided to take on the three main pillars of of oppression, which is economic injustice, racism, and gender gender oppression, and then focus that in a little bit more, because you know we we <laughs> our, our, um, we were always talking about transforming the world. We were always quoting Adrian Rich and the transformation of the world. But we decided, let's focus in a little bit on that transformation of the world. And so we decided we would focus very specifically on economic and then the and gender inequality um, and violence. That these that this would be in relation to women. So we say gender inequality. That's that's what that would be. Um, now, if we were doing it now, it would be broader, as we understand gender in a very different kind of way now. My goodness, than we than we did then. And then what we would do through that? Well, the reason we chose those is that what is it that that crushes women the most? And it is the fact they cannot be economically free, and the fact that they can't be physically free because of the violence against their bodies. That's there, our bodies. <laughs> um, so those those are critical pieces in the un understanding of this. So what we, how were we going to do it? We would, we got, our tools were political education that we did through workshops. There was, our, another tool was writing. We produced a newsletter that came out uh, four times a year in which everybody, all five of our staff, as well as our board and volunteers, wrote for. You didn't you didn't get to be just a writer for the one, for the newsletter. Everybody produce, produced for it, which was a great another really great way of engaging everybody in. It's not just that we do the work, you're the person who sees what's happening in that particular piece that you're doing. So write about it. Tell tell people about it. Um, we were talking today about how how we chose what we we're going to work on. We could see all these different issues, and one of the things we wanted to do, we knew we could we could take everything on. We knew we could lift things up and start organizing with them and get other people to engage in them. So we did a lot of work to create the Arkansas uh, Coalition Against Domestic Violence. That get that in place, then we didn't stay there, you know. We were the uh, people who really brought uh, high consciousness around child sexual abuse and around 1980-1981 into the state, brought people in to talk, you know, did workshops on it, Th those kinds of things. Our idea, idea was if we're going to make Arkansas a place that is progressive and a place that looks at equality and looks at justice, we're going to have to motivate people to do these things. So we'd start a lot of things and then pass them off and when they filled up enough of people to do the work. Um, and and so we worked on a lot of things. And the way you got to lead one is by having your interest in it. You could bring it to you could bring it to our our, our we had lots of meetings. <laughs> we had a weekly staff meeting, we had a quarterly <laughs> retreat and an annual retreat. And they were wonderful. We had a great time. We we would cover every wall laying out what our work was and what our work was going to be. And then we would look at it and say, you clearly are doing too much. You know, we need to take a piece of that and move it over here. But you would create your own team out of our little five. And so, you know, you might have five things going on and we, three of us would be working on this one and three of us on that, all the sorts of mixture back and forth. Um, but that, that led us to be able to do things which we had intense interest in, and also things rose up that we just had to, had to, had to address. Um, we thought that another way that we could make serious change in, in Arkansas is around cultural change. And the cult so the cultural work that I talked about earlier was a tremendous interest to us. And so we, th we looked around and we saw two things. One, people don't have the opportunity to enjoy the richness of what was moving in the, in the 70s and the 80s. 
And so we brought cultural workers in, into town in several ways. Um, we raised money and brought Sweet Honey in the Rock three times. The first time they appeared was at Central High School, which was an enormous thing for us to do. I mean, we, at that time, I think we had three staff people. And we, <laughs> a few of us, put our money on the line to be able to pay the view, and they didn't come for free. And um, it was uh, a major thing. And <clears throat> so here was this national organization of black women singing political songs, from both from the civil rights movement, from the women's movement, from the black power movement. It was all in, in, in those in those songs. We brought Odetta. We had a uh, down at what's that piece of place? Um, what is it? Vino's, I think. Vino's. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was a back room, and they let us have it on Monday nights. And we had, um, <laughs> we'd have open mics, and then at that point, lots and lots of women were coming through who were singers. And, I mean, we didn't pay them. Or we might charge somebody two or three bucks that, so we could pay for their, their travel. We had poets who came, people who, people who spent time with the Women's Project and at the Women's Project, just feeding a different way of thinking into the town, you know, getting that, that sort of widening of our scope of, of looking at things. And then I think our pride and joy was our library, and uh, which is connected a little bit to the library here because <laughs> two of the people, what the person who created it uh, worked here. Um, but. So when we look around, what do we see? That here's a time with, with this black leadership, women's leadership in particular rising, and all kinds of inf uh, information that's out there about other movements, and particularly, you know, out of the civil rights movement. All of, the, all of these, all of these uh, movements are producing all kinds of things. And so we decided to do a, a women's library of the books that you couldn't get here that you didn't find in your libraries, you didn't find in your bookstores. And so we, you know, leaned heavily on kitchen table press. We leaned heavily on, on all the all the what was being produced around the country by lesbians, by you know, by trans the just the very beginning of trans trans think uh, thinking about trans people at that time. But particularly around race. So that you could come in there, race and gender. So that you could come in there and borrow those books. You could just borrow them. You could basically, you know, it was, it was a very simple process. And so the idea that you couldn't go to a bookstore and get those is sort of inconceivable now. And you had no, no internet to go to to get them. You didn't have the access to ideas. And let me say, that's very, it's very clear. The parallel between this, the access to those ideas, and the elimination of access right now in this state. The idea that a town would take away the funding of its library. The idea that people would build themselves into school boards so they could eliminate what children can learn. This is the exact thing that I'm talking about. That that was what we were trying to do. Is not just we weren't fighting those forces in. We were fighting the forces of discrimination in general, which have consolidated into those attacks. So we were we were we were trying to put in people's hands the music, all the ways that you learn, you know, all the messages, uh, as as something that you didn't pay for, so that that costs you just nothing but your goodwill, you know, your desire for change to come in and, and take those books or see our little movies. We had, we had a film festival, you know. It was nothing we thought that we couldn't do. Uh, had a film festival more than, more than once. And, you know, organizing for the Martin Luther King Parade, organizing a queer community at a time when there weren't those public places other than bars that, that you could go. Um, so, anyway, that, that's the, those, those are the tools. Is Thinking of the cultural work that has political content, and then um, we we not only published the um, newsletter, they published published my books that um, 
when I first first wrote um, Homophobia and Weapons of Sexism, this this was produced by a feminist uh, press by accident. I had written it as I'd been doing um, um, I don't know what what what'd you say not only not speeches but workshops in particular on on homophobia and racism, and at that time you know there's. You know, some writing, but nothing like the world of writing that we have now. But anyway, I so I wrote up what I had learned from those workshops, from the people that were in the workshops, and put it, you know, it was going, you know, it's back when you Xerox things, I Xeroxed it, and it was, you know, it was kind of thick, and I was going to send it out to all of those places because there was like maybe a hundred of them, and um, a woman came out and said, I have a little press. Chardon Press. I think we could get five thousand dollars and publish that book. So they got a little grant of five thousand dollars, published it, and within a few years we had sold out of the Women's Project um, over thirty thousand copies, which gave us. They, I think they sold for like ten or twelve dollars each. So we got about you know eight dollars off them, and we were able to pay our salary. You know out of that. But that was the women's project doing that, you know. It was, it was the, and making that opportunity open for me and others to do these workshops and then to be, produce things out of that. And then they they published in the Tower of the Right when when I wrote that. So it's like, you know, this this amazing act, kind of collective collective effort. One story I think is important, which is when we came to realize child sexual assault, and that came through those of us who worked at Head Start, that I would be called down in the Fayetteville Head Start to see a child. You know, they would ask for having somebody who's directed second, second opinion, but I would see that. And then we were beginning to hear it through the domestic violence uh, programs. And so, as as we learned, we were learning about it. You, as you know, you was ourselves, and we started looking nationally for what was, what there was. And so we took in material and created a, you know, workbook book for for that. But the story is that I think is good for people who are younger now, uh, who didn't know about, uh, who don't know about having buses that you could ride out into rural areas. That we rented a film, you know, out of out of one of the. Um, Probably out of California, somewhere that we thought was where, where we thought smart people live, and uh, and we sent it out on buses to with with uh, information on how to ship, how to have a conversation about that film, and so we spread started spreading that information, and we work did workbooks and that kind of thing to to really move that and move it into the women's anti-violence movement. So that's one example. Um, I think the work the work that we did in women in prison. Uh, that went on for several years, and I didn't say the staff of, of the Women's Project was Carrie Lobel and Kelly Mitchell Clark and Lynn Frost and Janet Perkins and Demita, uh, Demita Marks. But Carrie went for the longest time down to that prison and uh, did trainings and did the thing that I thought was awfully smart is that it might be a training on uh, violence, you know. Um, was, might be a battery, but, and in that would be able to move work a little things. So there was always this this effort to to expand and move the consciousness of the women in in, in prison. The story I, I always love about it is the United Methodist women who stuck stuck with us over the years. I didn't tell the story about how we were threatened every year by the. Good News Methodists within the United Methodist Church who tried to close us down we were, when we were under the umbrella of the church. And, and it was because that we had lesbians, because we had black women, we had white women, we had lesbians, we had heterosexual women, and that's how we, that's how we lived. And uh, so they would attack us, and the United Methodist women would come in and fight for us at the, at the, <laughs> at the conference every year. And, uh, sustain us, and they supported us in so many ways, uh, which is interesting, because people think of, oh, church, that's conservative, because we think now of conservative churches as opposed to the liberating places that they can be. But they raised money, um, 
not raised money. They they volunteered volunteered this money, and bought um, uh, personal items for the women in prison because they weren't getting things like deodorant. They weren't getting things like tampons. And they, I mean, these we're talking like really necessary things that they needed, and they would be stacked in our office, and they would load them up and take them <laughs> load them up and take them down there. And then the thing that impressed me the most they did was. Uh, but we found out, of course, that women just couldn't see their children because people couldn't afford to bring them to them. And the United Methodist women volunteered to drive children to see their mamas. Which, I mean, imagine being in prison, you can't see your two-year-old. And many of those were older white women driving <laughs> little black children. And that, that image just stays in my mind of the possibilities that life, you know, that life can have. Um, the other uh, place that, that I think would, the work was remarkable was our work with women in the Delta. And that grew our black base uh, and broadened the Women's Project in an incredible way. We held two uh, black women conferences. This was, this was in the early, early 90s. And um, they, were, they were amazing, amazing. So people had this opportunity to come together to talk about the level of injustice that they live in and talk about the kinds of ways that, that people face that and how they make do and the change they do and then the, the, the ideas that they are creating on the ground in these small towns in the Delta to change, change the environment that they live in. And I think that was wonderful work. I think the, the work with um, women and non-traditional jobs, training training women up to be carpenters and being able to take on jobs that they weren't accustomed to having and to break through that barrier. Um, and then I would say I work against the right wing, um, which started because of the Posse Comitatus and the KKK and the Skedheads and the Covenant Sword of the Arm of the Lord, those people around. Um, marching and preening and threatening and but just you know emerging all the, all the time and, and trying to create fear and, and have it um, and move people toward their worst impulses and so we we there was nobody in the state that we saw as a nonprofit who was taking that on so we decided we would monitor them and we um, became um, connected to the Center for Democratic Renewal in Atlanta and they so we went to their conferences and trainings and they and we sent them information so it was this great working back and forth and so that required both some confrontation but particularly identifying and letting people know what's happening being part of this larger network of trying to trying to hold these forces forces back and keeping them from growing you know um, but out of that came the Women's Watch Care Network, which is, as we were monitoring them, we, we decided to do a, a project sponsored by the, paid for by the Methodist Church, where we created little groups around the state of, of trying to make them with at least groups of four people who had experienced uh, homophobic violence or religious violence or sexual violence or, or racist violence have them have conversations and come to an agree, one, come to see how some of how connected that violence is, and two, to see that they should, um, they could be part of a project where we identify these people. And, and so that we could actually educate the public to know this is what's happening. And some of it feels like it happens underground, but to raise it up, shine a light on it. And so we asked them to send us information and of the violence that was happening in those four categories. And what we discovered is that we had got way, way, way more violence against women than we did the other groups. But we had asked them, don't send us anything that's not printed, because we know we will not be believed if we cannot show concrete proof. So if you know your neighbor next door was beaten up it's not going to help us in this. This is going to be concrete information. So if you see it printed, send it to us. 
and we got it. We got stacks of it. And so we created we created a Women's Watch Care Net, Network log that we put out once a year. And eventually had to, we started all violence against women. And then we stopped and said, this is way too much. We only do murders. And so we recorded murders each year. An example here, now this is in, in the time in which the murders of black men in particular was happening. We had 76 women killed in that year. Um, we had, in 91, we had 83 killed, murdered. And we did a very, very difficult task, which was to name the person, where it happened, how it happened, the circumstances, were her children there, uh, were her clothes torn off, where was her body, you know, how people can do very terrible things not after they kill you. Uh, all of those, all of those details, and then how it turned out. And what we did with that was, one, put it out, make it as public as we possibly could, and then we used it to argue that women should be part of the Hate Crimes Act, which is a whole other story that I don't have time to start. And so the end of that is that we did, so we did that monitoring, because we had all kinds of people to do it with us or for us, because we had all kinds of people coming in and out of the Women's Project. When I said it was community building, that's because we not only we did these, these projects, we had parties, we had talk, you know, groups for people to just to talk about it, like being gay, and then being lesbian. We had people who um, came in who were sex workers. I mean, we had, uh, we had a trans woman who, who volunteered with us through the 80s when people weren't even talking about trans people. I mean, we, had, we had an open door of people coming in if they came in under that banner of looking for equality and justice, you know. And, and so we, in that monitoring and seeing all these people, and we could bring them more and more that you are, your eyes are important, your voice is important, you know. Bring, bring what you see, bring what you know, tell the story of you and what you're, what you're witnessing out there. That led us, I think, doing that work and, and monitoring the Klan, led us to be some of the prim primary researchers, um, and organ but particularly in organizing against the right wing. And so it carried that into the 90s when the attacks began to be more and more open, more visible, and to writing about it, too. We have lots and lots of um, transformations that the newsletter, that have articles about this is what is happening. This is why Ot Reverend Otwell is protesting in front of Bill Clinton's church. This is why, <laughs> you know, this is what is happening when you when you hear this, when you see that, um, it was, became a uh, critical, critical importance that the attack on homosexuals is not about the attack on homosexuals, it is about trying to actually do, to get, use this as a vehicle to attack people of color. If you can put that together, we will take you on the road to understand that. That was, that was our work. So back to the beginning, it's, it was, <laughs> And the ending, this it, it was the work to build to build community. It was the work to build social justice, and to try to do that in a way that was in a place that is not the most progressive state in the country, <laughs> but a state that those of us who live, live here love each other and love so much about the state and have that drive and that will and that desire to make something make something different. So. Um, it was 18 years of, I think, very solid work. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here, um, for doing this again a second time. Um, there at the end, you were talking about, you know, that Arkansas is not as progressive. I think that in the 80s, I felt, I mean, I was young, but I felt 
a, we were a blue place, right? We were a blue place. We were, um, there seemed to be some progressivism here. And um, we're doing this the week of the 2022 election. And we are definitely a red state now. So how does that, how, how is that directly affecting activism and movements in Arkansas today? The way I would hope it was affecting, I don't know that it is, that people would feel like they need to dig in and work harder. You know, yeah. that this, this is a time when um, I don't think it's a matter of trying to do kind of a soft approach. I think it's a matter of really saying, this is what we're facing. Be very clear, you know, that, that if you're 20 years old, you don't feel like you have too much in front of you. That's good. Yeah. And to say, let's, let's, let's start turning that around right now. You know, mm -hmm. and what is the way to, you know, what is the way to do that? And I, I, what I can say most of the way not to do it is not through divisiveness within your own group. <laughs> that this, the, the poison drifts in, you know, and so the competition, you know, all of the ways in which uh, our work is framed so often now in the, in the nonprofit and progressive sector um, of, of competition for money in order to survive. I, I think, but I think that in the state, there are enough places where you can work hard and make change. I, I admire the work of a lot of decarcerate. Now, that's in the middle of conservatism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put them in jail, build a bigger jail, you know, keep them in solitary confinement, don't, you know, don't, get, don't protect them from COVID, give them, give them uh, peculiar medicines for COVID. <laughs> um, but there's the incarcerate yeah. saying, no, you know. We're going to take we're going to take the line of justice here, and we're going to walk that line. And we're going to stay with it, no matter how much you press us and what what you do. We're going to be there. We're going to be there every day, and we're going to get it done. You talked a lot about um, the United Methodist Church and the support of organized religion mm -hmm. to your to the Women's Project and to the movement. And you mentioned for a second about you know that evangelicalism and conservatism in religion tends to give religion a bad name, but there, there are good people in churches doing social Absolutely. justice work um, that I think often don't get talked about, don't get heard because the other folks are being louder. <laughs> right. And you know, I, I also dislike how Evangelicals have been categorized into this one kind of oppressive group that is biased, bigoted, and unjust. I don't believe that. I believe that has been so carefully fed. You know, the politicizing churches starting in the, in the 80s was really an evil thing to do. Evil thing to do. To take this place where you're supposed to be in the land of the spirit, you know, in the land of... of Work, working with one another to make the world better, to lift people up. All, you know, all the language of the church, whatever ch church it is, mm -hmm. it's that, that's the language. I mean, there's the hellfire brim, brimstone <laughs> that I had plenty of in my life. But, but, that, but under that is always that. You know, it's the goodness of God, it's the goodness of Jesus, the goodness of you. And to infiltrate that and to carry that message in over and over and over and, and you know, build issues and, and curate those issues so that they get people emotionally riled up and feel like they're fighting, fighting for the existence of their God or the existence of their Jesus or their existence of their church. It's a very evil thing. So if one is of those beliefs, you know, you don't wish well for the ones who propagated that. <laughs> When you were talking about the the group of women that came together that became the core of the Women's Project, you know, it was women of all walks of life, all races, 
um, sexual orientations. And in the South, in the 80s, that sounds, you know, unbelievable, right? Because mm -hmm. we were, we still are a very segregated place for the most part. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that, about the, how important it was to come together as a group of all different folks or all different kinds of women so that you could get the work done. I, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it in, in that it was. Now, all this sounds a little idealized. You know, it wasn't that everything was perfect. Okay, right. <laughs> it's not true, we know that. But the, we, we worked hard to make it a place where everybody felt they had a place there. Not necessarily they were just, you know, petted and loved and admired and treated so, so kind of, you know, it's like, come on in. And then there was like, so you look at the walls, and on the walls were scads of posters. And those posters were representative of all kinds of things. So that was one place that um, we never just had a Christmas party, you know, that, that, that we felt that we should we should do the Jewish holiday, the holiday of the traditional, or the African American community. You know that would, that would we would always measure that. We had a big old party. You know, scads of food. We love that. We <laughs> stack people up in, a, in our uh, house that we had bought for our office. Um, and then there was so like the little little groups that could talk to each other. There was a place that you could go without feeling like you had to have. Um, a trained facilitator. <laughs> you had to have only your story to bring, or your, you know, that happened to you. Well, let me tell you what happened to me. <laughs> and then, what are we going to do about that? You know, that was that was that was the ask. Um, and then we had we had lots of events that you could you could join in and participate in. So, for example, with the. Uh, um, the burdens of women. One of the things we did to raise consciousness is that we created tombstones and put them all across the yard of the of the women's project with the with the name of each of the women who had been burdened did a press conference. Well, that engaged a lot of people making tombstones, and, you know. So it's, it's it's that sense that you're part of something. You don't have to be a public speaker. <laughs> you know, you don't. You don't have to have the smartest little comments <laughs> out there. You don't have to be able to to uh, do a Google Doc. Know how to do that. <laughs> you, 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 you bring what you got. Um, and what we did is try to create enough space, you know, for that to be be able to happen, and to see see groups that um, didn't have a place in society. At that time, so for example, for for years we had a lesbian retreat up in um, at a park outside of Fort, Fort Smith, and it was fantastic. You know, it's also people are so committed to sums of money now for what they do. We can't do so and so because we don't have you know five thousand dollars. Well, we got these retreats, and you you know you put in money for staying in. The, the, it had a kind of a dormitory and another building that you could meet in. And we just said, everybody bring food. <laughs> and think well, before you come what you'd like to lead in terms of what conversation you'd like to have happen. And you'd have out of 40 people or 50 people, you'd have 10 that, you know, I want to do this, I want to talk about this. And people could find their place in that. But just having that every day, to, every, not every day, every year, that you could call your own space, you know, that you're in a society that says, you know, something's very bad wrong with you, you're harmed to society, you have sickness, you're religiously, uh, you know, sitter. You know, those, those terms were so heavy all during that time. And here's a space where you can just be you. So... What happened to the Women's Project? Why did it go away? It's complicated, but it, it, the, part of the story is that a major accident happened. A huge tree fell in the building. 
and it was such an economic crush, as well as everything else. Yeah. And, and then there had been leadership change and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, back to the fact that we're in the week after the election. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Massachusetts <coughs> just elected its first openly lesbian governor, correct? Governor? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, Oregon but, has one. Yes. <laughs> but, but people aren't showing up to vote. How do we change that? How do we make, <laughs> make them show up to vote? Listen to me. I'm like a mother. <laughs> We're going to make them show up to vote. <laughs> but well, I mean, you know, that, that bothers me. That personally bothers me that I feel so strongly about voting, but people don't seem to, to show up. They don't seem to feel like that they're, their vote would count. I think there's a huge amount of distrust. But I think maybe since the Roe decision, some things like that where people see, oh, this is what happens. Oh, you might not have a library. Oh. Yeah, talk a little bit. You did mention <coughs> Craighead County and the, the library. Um, you know, they voted not to support their library, and that's just shocking. And the fact that we're saying things like, after the road decision. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully people will... Yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> that so many people voted for that library, that, put, that they had been sold on two things. One, they're ga gouging you for your taxes and they don't need it. And two, they're they're perverting your children, you know? And I don't know which came the first, I suspect it was the children mm -hmm. thing, because the disinformation is so great on that. Yeah. And, you know, it's all over, it's all, that's all over the country. Mm -hmm. But I do think that people in this election showed some backbone. I mean, there were, there are places that, um, not so much in Arkansas. <laughs> there are places where people really have turned turned out. You know, I mean those those uh, abortion amendments. Yes, that was that was pretty staggering. That was pretty that staggering. Really took mobilization of women. <clears throat> I'm sure men voted too, but I, it wouldn't have happened if women hadn't just been in rage rage about it. So it shows it shows there's you know it shows us impossible possibility, but. I think I think it's hard gerrymandering. Yes, is, is a killer, and that, I mean, why we can't? Well, what I don't know, know enough about how you could get rid of it. You know, what the, what tactic you would use or what strategies. <coughs> they did it before, but I don't remember how because there was a lot of gerrymandering um, in the, I guess, late 1900s early 20th century and maybe the voting <coughs> rights maybe voting rights did away with it but yeah we've got to figure that voter suppression gerrymandering and then you know get people to to go out and vote mm -hmm. um so final question <laughs> what do you want to tell the next generation of activists <coughs> what do you want them what do you think they should know from you? I think they need <clears throat> one to be courageous, <laughs> you know, and and believe in yourself and each each other. You have to believe in human possibility. If you don't, you know, and you ha I think you have to believe that we're all interconnected. That there are no little little side issues over here. <clears throat> and if they are, if the issues are interconnected, we have to be interconnected. So you can't have a movement without that. I mean, a lot, there are a lot of like single, single issue with, you know, <laughs> um, that you can't see anything beyond that. But I don't, I don't think that works. And you, you have to have joy, you know, you've got to have some fun. And um, I mean, that, that is what I remember the most throughout my my organizing life is how much how much fun I have, how, what great friends I made, you know, that 
just wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened otherwise. <coughs> I would have had I would have had friends, but not that kind of mind, body, and spirit that 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 opens opens up for you. So I'd say, you know, stay the course and uh, be bold. Don't be don't be scared to take take something on, but don't try to be don't try to be uh, famous. Don't don't put your put your time and your money on what is the smartest ad or the smartest <coughs> little you know meme. Yeah, do, do a little something, but boy, put your emphasis on what, how how are humans connecting with each other. Talking about your the friends you made, the fun you had, you know that day in September when we were all in the room downstairs and all the folks from the Women's Project showed up. That was that was a, a wonderful thing to witness. The, the conversations y'all had, the laughter that was happening mm -hmm. after you hadn't seen each other for a while. That yeah. was really a beautiful moment. To me, it was a statement of, of like verification of what 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 had the women's project had been mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. in, a, in a very amazing amazing way you can't fake that no you can't, <laughs> you can't, fake you that. can't. <laughs> i wish we had a video of it yeah yeah uh, that we just did stay somebody in the room just said oh let's like well, I mean, they got lots of lots of pictures that showed it showed a good bit of it but the depth of the caring for one another that was in the room you know but yeah. those shared experiences are Process. Yeah. Thank you so much for being <coughs> here. Thank You're you for welcome. your life of courage and truth. Um, it it's important, and I really appreciate you coming back in to record this. <laughs>